You are about to listen to a recording of an interview I did with Russell Targ, a physicist who was a pioneer in the development of the laser and was co-founder of a program run by the Stanford Research Institute, which investigated psychic abilities in the 1970s and the 1980s. His work in this new area, called remote viewing, has been published in several well-known scientific journals. Russell Targ is also an author and is the co-author of nine books dealing with the scientific investigation of psychic abilities. And his most recent book title is The Reality of ESP, A Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities. In 1997, Russell retired from Lockheed Martin Missiles and Space Company as a senior staff scientist. He's a student of A Course in Miracles and also a longtime friend of Judy Scutch Whitson, who is the founder and president of the Foundation for Inner Peace, publisher of the spiritual text known as A Course in Miracles. Russell now pursues ESP research in Palo Alto, California, and teaches remote viewing worldwide. Please enjoy this interview, and I hope you find it as enlightening as I did. Can you tell me a little bit about how when you discovered Course in Miracles? Yes, I discovered Course in Miracles in 1973. I met Judy Scutch, who is a publisher of Course in Miracles. I met her in New York because we were both interested in investigating Uri Geller, the wow. Israeli psychic. Right. And I had just started an ESP research program at Stanford Research Institute. And I met Judy through the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and she was a board member mm. with Edgar Mitchell. So I visited her in New York, and we became good friends. We immediately became friends. I grew up in New York, and we had very similar views on many things. She had just published Course in Miracles, and uh, she gave me a first edition, which I read, but it was too advanced for me. Those Jewish people have a hard time with Course in Miracles often, because Jews are very allergic or frightened to deal with Jesus. Yeah. So it took me quite a while before I really took Course in Miracles aboard. In fact, I didn't become a student of Course in Miracles until 1992. So it took me about 20 years after having Course in Miracles on my bookshelf Wow. before I became a student and... Shortly after that, I became a Course in Miracles facilitator and had a regular group in my home. And did you did you um, study Buddhism before a Course in Miracles? I had read Buddhism for many years. As a, I, I was a child member of the Theosophical Society. Ah. So when I was in graduate school in, in New York, Columbia University, in 1954, I was 20 years old, and I was already going to the Theosophical Society meetings in Midtown Manhattan, because I had a lifelong interest in psychic stuff. Mm. It, was, it was clear to me as a young person, as a young person, I used to do stage magic. Ah. I, was a, I was a young magician. And what was clear to me from my magical experiences standing on the stage is that sometimes I would have a psychic impression pertaining to the life stream of the person whose mind I was pretending to read. So I was doing a trick. So as a result of the trick, I knew something about the person who had stood up in the audience that I was interacting with. Mm -hmm. But in the course of pretending to read her mind, I would occasionally get actual pictures of what her house looked like and what the stairs and the bedroom, so I could include some genuine psychic experience into the trick uh, that I was doing on the stage. Wow. And as a, young, as a young scientist, it became more interesting to me to try and understand how this genuine extrasensory perception worked rather than continuing to stand on the stage and fool people. Mm. So by the time I was a graduate student, I'd given up doing magic 
and was reading the Professional Journal of Parapsychology. And I had met J.B. Ryan at Duke University, and I got involved with the Theosophical Society. And that society was also very interested in the paranormal. Yeah. There are two. And in, in my new book, in the reality of ESP, uh, that was published by the Theosophical Society. So 50 years later, I'd gone full circle so that my, my very first formal teachers were the Theosophical Society hmm. and I invited them to publish my last book, the reality of ESP, hmm. because I wanted to do, uh, homage to Annie Besant and Charles Ledbeater, who were founders of the society with uh, Helena Blavatsky. And in India, in 1895, Ledbeater and Annie Besant, who were great clairvoyants, would sit quietly, close their eyes, and describe the atomic structure of various atoms in the periodic table. And they published a long magazine article in 1895 called Occult Chemistry. And in writing my book, I went to the New York Public Library and had a chance to read the original copy of Occult Chemistry in their Lucifer magazine from 1895. And in that, uh, Ledbeater was drawing pictures of what different kinds of uh, hydrogen look like in a block of paraffin. Mm. Paraffin has 50 hydrogen atoms and 25 carbon atoms, and that's what makes paraffin, uh, H H50, C25. And he noticed that there were three different kinds of hydrogen in this paraffin, and he called them hydrogen, occultium, and agiarium because Adyar was the city in India where they were doing this. So he discovered the isotopes of hydrogen, and he did that before isotopes were the... He did that before the idea of isotopes even existed, and long before the isotopes of hydrogen had ever been found. Wow. And he showed that the structure of proton was actually a triangular object equilateral triangle with a little bundle of energy, a fundamental energy unit at each corner of the triangle, and these energy units were connected by some kind of resonant energy. So each proton was actually a little triangle. That's in 1895. If you go to Google, if you go to uh, Wikipedia today and look up gluon, mm-hmm you'll find that I misspoke. If you go, if you look up quarks, quarks. You'll, you'll find the Q-U-A-R-K. Yep. Quark, quarks. It is thought that protons are made up of three quarks in a triangular arrangement connected by energy. So if you look up Clark, if you look up quarks in the Wikipedia, you'll find that they look exactly like the quarks that Leadbeater drew a century before from his direct psychic perception. Hmm. So that was my inter- my my as a young physicist, the fact that he was drawing quarks at that time, and and for me it was 1954. I was just out of graduate school, and it was clear to me that he not only was amazingly psychic, but even had direct access to the submicroscopic level of the universe. <laughs> wow. And, and why, so, why, so, that, so why, why is our society so anti-psychic? You know, society, in the, in the sense society, that, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, we're still recovering from the so-called Enlightenment. See, during the time of the Enlightenment, maybe the uh, middle 1700s, uh, science was just emerging from domination of the church. Now, in the middle 1600s, uh, Galileo was under house arrest and threatened with torture. At the end of the 1600s, uh, Newton 
uh, surfaced with a correct description, verifiable description of the way the universe works. So science burst forward at the end of the 1600, beginning of the 1700, and they got out from underneath the thumb and the torture of the church. So science wanted to move itself away from anything like the uh, mysticism right. and power of the church. Very Newtonian. So science, that's right. So, sci- so science today is still very resistant to anything that looks mystical or religious. Which is very unscientific. That's right. <laughs> so science, science should go with the data. Yeah. So the, the, the evidence for psychic ability is now very, very strong indeed. In fact, in, in my book, In the Reality of ESP, I'm saying the subtitle, of the, A phys- Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities, mm. and the idea is that the statistical evidence for psychic abilities is now ten times stronger than the evidence that aspirin prevents heart attacks. So the odds in uh, scientific terms we publish in Nature magazine or the proceedings of the Institute of Electrical Engineers, our data are odds of one in a million or even more hmm. that our experiments show the reality of ESP. So our, our odds, our scientific evidence is 10 times greater than the evidence for aspirin preventing heart attacks. And we're beginning to get acceptance. That as we publish our findings in the uh, proceedings of the Society of Electrical Engineers, the American Institute of Physics, hmm. Nature, so forth. So we're, we're beginning to get scientific uh, acceptance for our data. And the main acceptance we get is that people all over the world can replicate our findings. <clears throat> so the... Uh, the eventual proof and acceptance will come from people who do our do experiments uh, resembling those that we did at Stanford Research Institute. In a way, the best evidence for remote viewing, which is the psychic ability we investigate, what what we teach people to do is quiet their minds and then describe and experience what's going on in a distant place and. Uh, they're able to learn to do that with great accuracy and reliability. Mm. And we did that work for the U.S. government during the Cold War. Mm. So we had a applications and research program from 1972 to 1995. So we had a 23-year uh, operational program doing psychic work for the U.S. government, CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, for 23 years in about a $25 million program. So I would say that the most paranormal thing that we experienced in a certain sense is that we could get money from the government for 23 years to examine psychic abilities and month after month provide them with data about where a general had been kidnapped or how the hostages were doing that had been captured by Iran or where a downed Russian airplane was, or about a Russian submarine being constructed, or a Chinese atomic bomb tests. Mm. So we were doing all kinds of amazing things for the government, which is what kept our fu- ourselves funded. So the, my so, book has really two kinds of evidence. Yeah. Uh, we show scientific evidence where week after week, somebody would hide in the San Francisco Bay Area and we would then have to describe what it looks like where he's hiding. Mm. And then uh, working with a psychic policeman, he was able to describe the place successfully seven out of nine times. So, for example, if my partner had been kidnapped nine days in a row, we would have found him the first place we looked seven out of those nine days. Mm. The odds of that is a million to one. So that's one kind of data, and we can then publish that in the Proceedings of the Engineering Society. That's amazing. The other, the other kind of data would be for the CIA to call us up and say, 
the Russians have crashed an airplane full of code books, a reconnaissance airplane belonging to the Russians, crashed in North Africa. We can't find it. Can you help us find it before the Russians? So two of our psychics, one in California, one in Maryland, both drew maps and put a little circle around a place in northern Africa between a village and a river, and the Americans could then send a task force and find the airplane before the Russians. So, And we then got a commendation on the air from Jimmy Carter for having found that. So if the government knows this, why, why isn't it telling us? Well, they supported us for all those years. Uh, they then ended the program in 1995 because uh, the U.S. government said that uh, with the end of the Berlin Wall and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, America no longer has any serious enemies. So we don't need to support the psychic uh, you are the psychic core anymore. See, even though we were doing, see, the, th- the operational things we were doing were all secret. Hmm. So the American Congress didn't know about them. Oh. So, okay. so we had, uh, criticism and ridicule from Congress. What Congress wanted to know why is the CIA and Army spending money on psychic warfare? And the army couldn't tell them. <laughs> right. But, but we had a very successful 23 year run. And my experience <clears throat> was that, uh, I, the remote viewing we do is really a two person game. It involves a psychic who's quiet his mind and describes what he's seeing. on his mental screen or in his awareness, that's one person, that's a psychic. Generally, there's an interviewer working with him, and that was usually me, and I'm coaxing the person on, tell me what you see, tell me what you're experiencing, uh, what colors come to view, uh, if you turn around, what else is there to see? So it's really a two-person game hmm. because uh, the psychic doesn't know if what he's saying is correct. Right. But I can, as an interviewer, I can steer him away from naming and guessing. So in... How do you do in, that? So a person closes his eyes and I said, okay, Joe has been taken by his colonel to some place in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, quiet your mind and tell me about the surprising images hmm. that appear in your awareness. And the person might say something like, well, it looks to me like Macy's department store. Well, Macy's department store is really the name of a place. Mm. And it's an analytical construct. So I will tell him, uh, please don't tell me about Macy's. I want to know what you're experiencing. Let's start over. Let's take a break. And then tell me what you're experiencing, what shows up in your awareness that makes you say Macy's. And he'll say, well, I see something that looks like a row of wire coat hangers. I see many wire coat hangers on a pole connecting them. And I say, can you draw that? And in the end, it turns out <clears throat> that the traveler was not at Macy's, but was at a pedestrian overpass crossing the freeway and that overpass is made of steel and has um, wire frames all along the edge to prevent people from jumping off the overpass into the traffic. So if you stood with a person where the traveler was standing, you would see this uh, squares within squares within squares that look like a row of coat hangers. Yeah, and, and I, I, saw, pop- I saw that in your video. So uh, the person saw and drew exactly what was there, and it's my job as an interviewer to keep him from doing a- analysis right. and describe what he's experiencing. 
So my experience in doing this for 10 years was to finally conclude that people were actually uh, much more than the meat and potatoes we see in the laboratory. The people obviously had a nature that allows them to experience what's going on in the distance. Mm -hmm. So modern physics says that we live in a non-local space-time. That's the the most interesting thing that I know about psychic ability is that the accuracy and the reliability is independent of distance and independent of time. Mm. That it is no long it's no harder to describe something that's in Soviet Siberia six thousand miles away than it is to describe what's across the street. Hmm. So distance did not degrade our abilities. So surely this this must have been used to investigate uh, the existence of extraterrestrial life, for example. Well, as a scientist, we were not so interested in extraterrestrial life because it's very hard to verify that. But what became clear to me is that who we really are is this non-local awareness. So it's a, it became evident to me that uh, our nature is non-local. You know, the person is sitting in the laboratory described drinking a cup of coffee, but he is able to experience and describe what's happening thousands of miles away, independent of his body. So in a certain sense, uh, it was the remote viewing for the CIA that led me back into a spiritual pursuit. <laughs> Because it's the idea that uh, if you think that who you are is what you smear in the morning, then you're in for a lot of suffering. At least mm. that's my experience. So it becomes clear that the Buddha said it right, that who you are is this non-local awareness. And in the 8th century, the famous Buddhist teacher named Padma Sambhava, he wrote a book called Self-Liberation, through seeing with naked awareness. And naked awareness really is this non-local awareness that allows you to experience and describe what's in the distance and what's in the future. And Padma Zimbabwe has teaching that's very much like Course in Miracle teaching. He says that there's there's four noble truths in Buddhism. Hmm. Uh, the, the first noble truth is there's suffering. And people generally agree with that, they're suffering. Second noble truth is that they're suffering and people don't like it. And the thrust of Buddhism <clears throat> is to give you instructions and a program for dealing with the suffering that people don't like to experience. And that suffering is generally concerned with defending your ego. Mm. The ego is a cause. Unless you are presently in a concentration camp being tortured if that's not the case if you're sitting at home quietly suffering then that suffering is internally induced it's it's as a result of your thought processes and Padma Zimbabwe says that's not necessary that suffering is all caused by your ego and defense of your ego <clears throat> and if you can give up your desire to name things and grasp onto things and defend what it says on your business card, then you can move from conditioned awareness, which is what he called it. Conditioned awareness is the awareness where you're defending your ego, and you can move to naked awareness or timeless awareness and experience the universe as it really is. Then the suffering is diminished because you see that the suffering is a mental construct. Mm. So this is very similar to the Course in Miracles teaching that everything I experience has only the meaning I give it. Because mm. in the uh, Buddhist ontology, things do exist, but the universe is really empty of meaning. The universe is not empty of cups and saucers, not empty of people. It's empty of meaning. Mm. And you get to assign whatever meaning you like to the things you experience. That's why in remote viewing, you can't really name things. You, you can't name Macy's department store. 
Oh, I Macy's, see what you mean. Macy's department store is just a construct. Right, right. Because that gets you all... into your mind and you start the, the analytical process which blocks the intuitive process. That's right. And that was completely understood in the 8th century. So re- remote viewing is not new age. But the uh, teaching is completely in agreement with Course in Miracles. The suffering comes from analysis, naming, and defending your ego. And that's a subjective thing that you can do or not do. You can learn to, to give that up and move your awareness into the spacious realm. Into You can move. It, it was amazing to me as a physicist that in the 8th century, a teacher was describing timeless awareness. He said, he said there is no time. T- time is just an illusion. And uh, you're able to look into the distance, look into the future, heal the sick, diagnose the illness, and talk to the dead people. Because uh, although bodies die, the... So sorry. Right. Although uh, although bodies die, uh, your awareness is immortal. Hmm. There, there there is no time for your for your awareness. So the, the many people have the experience of communicating with others who have passed away, hmm. and the the evidence for that is very strong. The evidence of survival after bodily death that evidence is very strong. Yeah. And. There's writing about that today as there was 1,200 years ago. Yeah. And surely you must have read what the Course says about psychic abilities. Yeah, the Course, uh, really in the teacher's manual, yeah. says that psychic abilities and reincarnation are outside the Course of Miracles. If you want to believe in them, that's okay. Mm. Uh, but psychic abilities are... Uh, neither part nor excluded from Course in Miracles. As, course in, as my, my understanding is that, uh, teacher's manual suggests that you, you may, you may indeed experience clairvoyant perception. Mm-hmm. That Hel- Helen says that you, you can experience clairvoyant perception and that is part of nature to be experienced, but is not particularly part of the Course in Miracles teaching. Yeah, yeah. That is the the miracle uh, that the Course in Miracles t- is talking about is not magical reality, but the miracle is one's personal realization that there is no separation in consciousness. Mm. Yeah. And the Buddhist taught that. Uh, potentially taught. Yeah, potentially was a Hindu. And he taught at the time of Christ uh, that there is no separate separation is an illusion, and that there is no separation between consciousness. He was aware that there is a separation on the physical plane; that is, there is a separation between big cities; they're hundreds of miles apart, so that kind of separation does exist. But there's no separation in consciousness, mm. and that was understood. In uh, Hindu teachings, the Patanjali, and in Buddhist teachings, as well, there's a Buddhist big monograph called the uh, Flower Ornament Scripture, big 1,500-page book, and part of that is devoted to what the Buddhists at that time called super knowledge, which is a description and instructions for seeing into the distance, seeing into the future. Uh, communicating with the dead, uh, hearing things that are said at a long distance, diagnosing illnesses, and this is all described in considerable detail. And, and I reproduce uh, the chapter from the Buddhist he- scripture in in my new book because I thought that it was a two thousand year, year old description in quite a bit of detail pertaining to exactly what we were doing uh, for the government uh, in the late 
Well, this is extraordinary, Russell. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how forgiveness has played a role in your life? I understand what you're asking. I would say that that's not. Uh, well, I'm aware that I'm aware that forgiveness is a cause of suffering. That I I misspoke. Uh, holding a grudge is a big cause of suffering. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, and the forgiveness is the road to undoing the suffering from holding a grudge. There's fear of there's an importance in forgiving other people as well as forgiving yourself. That some people feel uh, suffering as a result of missed opportunities in the past, and that can keep a person. Uh, depressed for a lifetime because they keep replaying the experience. If only I had done something different, I would have gotten that job or I'd have gotten that girl and I just made that mistake and they keep replaying how they might have done that. Mm. And it's very important to take control of your mind so that you don't um, have that ongoing grief and guilt from things you've done in the past because you can't undo them. Yeah. Similarly, I had a experience with uh, a colleague, a good friend who had betrayed me uh, in the course of my work. Mm-hmm. And then in the 1990s, uh, I was ill. It looked like I had a recurrence of cancer. And it was pointed out to me that I'm not going to get better until I forgive all the people for whom I am currently holding a grudge. Mm. If I don't if I don't forgive all the people for whom I have a negative attachment, I will carry that negativity with me. And I telephoned my friend and I said, you know, we, we've had a lot of differences, but uh, I think it's now ten years later or fifteen years later and I would like to make amends, resume our friendship, and I'm prepared to forgive you. And he immediately said to me, well, I'm happy to hear from you because I certainly did things that I'm not proud of. And he has now resumed being one of my best friends, re- regular luncheon companion, uh, a person with whom I have very, very much in common. Mm. And it's the idea that you can't be mentally and physical well if you are carrying grudges and continuing to nourish yourself on the animosity that you feel toward other people. Hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what is your understanding of how, for instance, holding a grudge causes a physical illness uh, in our bodies? Well, the idea of psychoneuroimmunology that if you hold a grudge, if you wake up every morning thinking of all the people who have done bad things to you uh, and ha- and are judgmental, that the idea of the Buddhist idea principally that judgment causes suffering, the old idea that from the time of Christ, uh, uh, Nargajuna was a great Buddhist logician who explained the teachings of Buddha. Some of the teachings of Buddha are very paradoxical. Hmm. And 500 years later, Nargajuna explained what that's about. And, and, I, and I have a book uh, in homage to Nargajuna that I wrote called The End of Suffering. And he pointed out that uh, as we view things in the world, most things are neither true nor not true. See, Aristotle said there is no middle. Aristotle is famous for the law of the excluded middle. Aristotle said a thing is either true or it's not true. It's either black or it's not black. Mm. And he is famous. What we know now is uh, the law of the excluded middle. Nagarjuna, 500 years later, said most of our suffering is due to Aristotle. (laughs) He taught that the middle is excluded uh, a thing is either true or it's not true. Nargajuna said, 
as you look at the world around you, what you find is that most things are neither true nor not true, and that the middle, most things reside in the middle. And Aristotle said it's impossible; nothing resides in the middle. So one of the Buddha's teachings is that whenever you make a judgment, like chocolate is better than vanilla, or this person is better than that person, whenever you make a distinction of judgment or personal preference, uh, you generally make a mistake. He's not saying you should give up your discernment.、Hmm. Uh, there's no doubt that、uh, freedom is better than persecution. And、uh, liberty is better than、uh, incarceration. So Nargajuna is not saying、uh, to give up discernment, but he's saying that in matters of taste,、uh, there's、uh, a great arbitrariness where things cannot be verified. Yeah. Would you call that non-dualistic thinking? Is there such a thing that's, as that's absolutely non-dualistic thinking?、Mm. My wife and I had a trivial example of that that we realized last night. We live very comfortably in Palo Alto, and some of our big decisions is what kind of nuts we should put on our ice cream. <laughs> that, 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 that's the kind of decision that we're we're struggling with. So we spent a lot of time trying to find a store that made sliced almonds for our ice cream. And we were very happy when we found that. And then、uh, one day that store went out of business, and we couldn't find them anymore. And then we had to go back to、uh, slivered almonds, which are sort of crunchy almond bits. And we discovered that although we had disparaged them for almost a year, we actually liked them better than the <laughs> ones that we had been searching for all the time. So it, it's an example. Of the logical positivists that、uh, that you always logical positivists of the early 20th century, Alfred Ayer and Bertrand Russell and、uh, Wittgenstein, all said that、uh, whenever you make a distinction that can't be verified, then you're talking nonsense.、Mm. So to say that、uh, Jesus is better than Buddha. Is a、uh, it's going to cause a lot of suffering. A lot of people are going to be killed over that.、Mm. Or to say slivered almonds are better than sliced almonds, it's going to cause a lot of suffering because、uh, it can't. There's no difference, so you can't make a distinction. So whenever you <clears throat> have a vested interest in a perceived truth of a form that can't be verified. A lot of people are going to get killed over it because、mm. you can hold that as a cherished outcome,、yeah. even though you can't prove it. And because you can't prove it, you can only defend it by shouting louder. Right, but of course we can have preferences, but as long as we're not attached to our preferences, is that what you're saying? That's right.、Uh, attachment is the biggest big source of suffering. That I can like chocolate better than vanilla. And that's my preference, and the world runs smoothly until I insist that you also like chocolate better than vanilla,、mm. and and then we have a war. <laughs> what is what is the hope for your work going forward? I know it's a big question, but you know you you clearly have a lot to share, and a lot a lot to tell the public because you've just explored. Both the scientific and the spiritual, in great depth. Well, as a scientist, the thing that I'm most interested in is the nature of precognition. That is, when I said earlier that the evidence shows that it's no harder to describe something far away than it is to describe something nearby, and I said that's evidence for a non-local perceptual ability. Similarly, it's no harder to describe something that's going to occur a few days in the future than it is something contemporaneous. And many people have precognitive dreams, where they have a dream on Sunday night of what they're going to experience Monday morning. 
Hmm. And you say, well, how could that? For example, I had a dream not too long ago of a toy electric train set running around the near the ceiling of my living room. I have a high ceiling living room, and in this dream, the electric train was running around the, just below the ceiling of the living room. So I woke up and told my wife about that because I recognized that that's a precognitive dream. Hmm. It's not a wish fulfillment dream. It doesn't pertain to my anxiety. It's not left over from the previous day, but it's a bizarre, very clear experience outside of my ordinary realm of experience. So that's how I would recognize this precognitive precognitive. Hmm. For example, if you dream about failing an examination and it's an exam for which you have not studied, uh, we wouldn't consider that precognitive. That's just what you would expect. Hmm. So the next day, after my electric train dream, in the morning, first thing I do in the morning is get a cup of coffee and then look at my home page on the computer, which is the New York Times. Hmm. And the picture on the front page of the New York Times was the elevated trains in downtown Chicago, Illinois, where I grew up. And the point of the story is that the elevators are now 100 years old, even older than I am. And the elevated trains have to be repaired because the tracks are beginning to fall apart. So the first thing I saw on my screen were these electric trains running in a circle around downtown Chicago, and that part of Chicago is known as the loop because the electric trains, the elevated trains, run in a circle around the loop, Mm. just as I saw in my dream with the electric train running in a circle around the ceiling of my house. So I would say that my dream early Monday morning of electric trains was triggered are stimulated by my seeing electric trains two hours later on the television. So it's a physicist would say that's retro causality. Monday morning's New York Times was a cause of Sunday night's dream. The future is affecting the past, or in this case, the future is causing the past. So as a physicist, it's very interesting to me that you can have this kind of retro causality. Because a physicist in general likes causal loops, ca- causal events to go from the past to the future. Mm. When a physicist says that force equals mass times acceleration, that the more force you apply to the little wagon, the faster the wagon will go, but you would like the force to be applied to the wagon before the wagon starts to move. So that, that the ordinary causal direction. A physicist is very upset uh, when a man is thinking about pushing the wagon and the wagon starts to roll and then he pushes it. That's, that's not the usual course of events. Hmm. However, the evidence is that in remote viewing and psychic ability is absolutely no harder to describe an event that's going to occur a few hours in the future or days in the future than it is to describe a contemporaneous event. So, for example, we demonstrated that by forecasting changes in the silver commodity market. Mm -hmm. We found that in an experiment we did, we were forecasting whether the silver market would go up or down a lot or a little, uh, nine weeks in a row, and all nine of our forecasts were correct. No errors. We made $120,000 and BBC Horizon made a 90-minute film about our exploits called The Case of ESP. Hmm. And that's a case where a person was able to describe on Monday morning what we would show him next Friday determined by what the silver market did. And that was a perfect experiment, odds of a million to one. And it was a precognitive experiment. His experience on Monday was triggered or caused by what he was going to see five days later. And that we did that without error. Wow. So, so we, we know that the evidence 
for precognition is as strong as the evidence for any kind of psychic ability. And what it shows is that we do not understand the nature of causality. And for a physicist, not to understand causality is a very serious problem. Because we like to think that we have free will and that objects move after you touch them, not before you touch them. So I would say that my principal interest right now is to understand a little more about precognition. Because what we, what we know, what the, th what our theory is, is that there is always a path through the complex space time where we live. There's always a path, e even though you and I are separated by 6,000 miles, there is a path between us that has no distance. Hmm. I think Judy Sketch wrote a book with a title like that, like called Journey Without Distance, yeah. which is the uh, story of the Course in Miracles. Yep. Well, well I, I think that our perception is a journey without distance. Hmm. I think she had, she had the right idea. She she didn't write that. Um, maybe um, Robert Scotch. Bob Scott Bob Scotch wrote that yeah. Journey Without Distance. And I think that is a correct description of the universe that we live in where our awareness is able to experience things that are physically far away, but we can do them as though they were next door. And that pertains to seeing things in the future as well. So what are so your thoughts my, on, fr on free will? Does it exist? Uh, my, my thoughts on free will are that we have less of it than we'd like to believe. Mm. I think that we have a small amount of free will. By and large, uh, I believe that events have causes. I'm so I'm a determinist. I think that uh, the events that you do, the thoughts that you experience, have causes, and those causes in general run in the ordinary causal direction. So, for example, we could do an experiment where you get to choose whether you're going to have a dish of Chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, or strawberry ice cream. And I say to you, can you get to freely choose which one you're going to choose? Here they are in front of you. Don't let me prejudice you. Take all the time you want. You choose which one you want. And you experience your free will to do that. Meanwhile, the psychic next door has already written down her predic prediction and said that Ken is going to choose strawberry. And then you choose strawberry and she comes in and shows you what she had chosen for you a half hour before and that experiment works very very well wow that that is uh we've published experiments in the proceedings of the engineering society showing that one person gets to sit down with me my mm -hmm. friend Hella Hammett we would make a tape recorder where somebody would go an hour in the future, and that would all be recorded, and we'd leave and go have coffee. Meanwhile, the outbound person was driving around at 9.30 who had operated a random number generator that would tell him, go to target 17. Target 17 would be a, a swing set in a park, and he would go there and sit on the swing, and then we would listen to her audio tape where she said I see him walking into a black triangle and the rhythmic squeaking back and forth like a piston that needs oil and it goes squeak 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 and that's exactly what the swing was doing as he would sit on it and her description was a full hour before he even shows where to go from a big group of 60 possible places so we would say that Probably, what I would say is that, my, my viewer's name was Hella, I would say that Hella's experience at noon was a trigger for her precognition two hours earlier. It's as though she was reading her own mind in the future. <laughs> wow. So, so really the answer is, 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 is not yes or no. It, it, it's more complex than we think. The answer to that's is right. their free will. That's that's right. You have 
my my opinion is that by and large, uh, you have free will to the extent that you can make use of your psychic abilities. Mm, that is the power it, of the it, mind, really. Yes, if you're limited to the material plane, where Newton's laws work, and you spend your time walking around on the pavement and your attention is focused on the pavement and what's happening in front of you uh you're you don't have very much free will mm. things are pretty things are pretty causal mm. uh if your awareness moves into timeless awareness uh, then you have some control mm. a good friend of ours john mack was killed in england a few years ago he was an American university professor, and he had just given a lecture on uh, T.S. Lawrence. What's Lawrence's proper name? T.E. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. And, he had, right. and John Mack had received a Pulitzer Prize for his book about Lawrence, and he went to England to talk about the anniversary and then he took the underground to visit his friend, and as he stepped off the pavement, he was killed by a car. It was very tragic. It was a good friend of mine. Mm. But what we would say is that if his awareness had been in a larger realm, he would have known to be super cautious or gone to England with somebody or felt apprehension and was cautious of this tragic event in his future, he might have uh, saved his life. Hmm. That's called a presentment, and the evidence for presentment is very, very strong. Experiments are done in, in the United States and in England where people are shown... Uh, pictures on a computer screen. Some of the pictures are neutral, like flower gardens or pens and pencils and things. And some of them are provocative, either sexual things or automobile accidents. And you never know what you're going to see hmm. because it hasn't been decided. So what happens is that the experimenter measures your skin resistance and your heart rate and in the instances when you're going to see a frightening picture, your heart rate will accelerate two or three seconds before the computer even chooses the picture to show you. Mm. So your body knows in advance that you're going to be frightened. <laughs> now, a person who has moved his awareness from conditioned awareness into timeless awareness can become aware of these dangerous things that are happening in the future. Mm. And so how, See, how what, course, what, in, in, of course in miracles teaches that a lot of suffering is, is due to defending your ego, which is exactly uh, conditioned awareness. If somebody says to you, uh, I don't like the dress you're wearing. Why, why are you still wearing that same old thing? Uh, you have a number of choices. You can internalize that and feel insulted and crushed that once it, once again you're doing the wrong thing. Or you can do as the Dalai Lama does, which is to laugh at most of the questions that he's asked. <laughs> the Dalai Lama is a very respectful man, and people always come and ask him questions, and his response frequently is to, is to laugh not really laughing at them, not ridiculing them, but recognizing that the question shows how little understanding the person has. That the question <clears throat> reveals their ignorance. Hmm. <clears throat> so that if somebody insults your, your dress today or your outfit, you can either take that on board and feel crushed, or you can just laugh at them and recognize what a stupid, arbitrary, uh, random thing that they have just said. That is, you don't have to right. pa paste the, every insult in your scrapbook and carry it around for the rest of your life. Yeah. 
that is uh whether you're dressed as beautiful or not is a completely subjective occurrence and because somebody doesn't like it that doesn't mean that it's good or bad mm. so you don't have to you don't have to accept every insult that comes your way right and as the course tells us it's it's a call for love that's the That's right. It's a call for love. Mm. And how how would you recommend? So, you have, so you've got a little free will, but not very much. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. How would you recommend people move into timeless awareness? The answer, of course, is meditation. You have to find a way to stop the ongoing chatter, where you're worried about. What people think about you, what's going to happen tomorrow, what the future, what you've done in the past. Um, there's uh, grieving over the past, feeling guilt over the past, and anxiety over the future is what prevents you from experiencing the present, as you know. Mm. So a meditation that allows you to quiet your mind mm. and escape from condition aware in condition awareness. Your focus is on what people think about you, mm. and de defending. We spend a lot of effort creating beautiful business cards, where a business card tells the story of who we think we are, and uh, that's of course just a story. And it's useful to have a business card with your name and address, but it causes suffering if you think that who you are is what it says on your business card. Because that can be taken away from you. When I worked at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, I noticed from their weekly newspaper that there was a huge excess of people dying shortly after they retired. Hmm. So what happens is that when they lose their security clearance and their business card and their identification as a senior engineer, suddenly they're nothing. They used to be a senior engineer, and now they're they're nothing, and then they die. In the huge excess in deaths, and this is not only Lockheed, but it's many, and it's, it's the Army and other research laboratories. When people lose the identity that they've had on their business card for a lifetime, hmm. and they've really uh, taken that as indication of who they are. Hmm. Uh, it's very bad for their health. And the same could be said of a uh, loss of a spouse, couldn't it? Absolutely. So you have to reside. If you don't want to have that experience, if you don't want to be have your life conditioned by materiality, you have to be able to move your awareness into timeless awareness, into naked awareness, and allow at least some portion of your time to reside outside of space and time into the spacious realms mm. and that's available and to get started in that the only way to get started is to stop the mental chatter and quiet your mind and then consciously move into naked awareness and naked and what it's naked of is that you've given you've thrown away all your clothes you've thrown away your story and you move into the spacious realm mm. And that's all available. Mm. And it's exactly as the Course in Miracles says, is that you have to give away your ego to uh, move away from suffering and into peace and love. Mm. What is your opinion about this, the law of attraction? You know, it's very kind of all the New Age teachings, I would guess. I think the law of attraction is a big source of suffering. Mm. It, it says that... Uh, if you're poor, it's your fault. If it, it sort of conveys the idea that if you're suffering, uh, if you were a better person, you wouldn't be suffering. And I think that that's often not true, especially in the times we're seeing now. That is, there's huge unemployment. People are being fired and it's not their fault. They're being fired because the companies want to make more money and they do that by firing their expensive employees or a person can be born 
into impoverished circumstances and never have an opportunity to get a good education. And that's not their fault either. Hmm. So the course of attraction seems to be teaching that if you're poor or if you're sick, it's your fault. That if you had a better mental picture, you wouldn't be poor and you wouldn't be sick. And I think that's not true. I think that having a positive mental attitude is desirable, but you really need the antecedents to get started. Hmm. So I think that uh, it's, again, blaming the sort of a Calvinist idea, blaming the undeserving poor. If they were des- if they were deserving, they would have more money. So I think the law of attraction uh, does not attract me. Mm. <laughs> Russell, thank you so much. Do you want to? Thank wanna... you for the opportunity. I'm very happy to chat with you. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to mention to our listeners? Well, one thing I'd like to mention is that most of what I've described here is in my new book, The Reality of ESP. Mm physicist proof of psychic ability and people can communicate with me through my website which is www.espresearch.com and I'm happy to answer queries that people send to me for my website I guess one other thing I could mention is that uh, the first money that we had for the ESP research program at Stanford was for an ESP teaching machine that I developed. Hmm. We were able to interest NASA in supporting a feedback and reinforcement device to help people develop their psychic ability. And I brought that four-choice training machine to a meeting with Werner von Braun and the chief administrator of NASA. And at that meeting, von Braun did very, very well with my ESP teaching machine. And he encouraged NASA to give us some money to pursue that. And in the research program, people were able to learn to quiet their mind and see what's going to be offered them in the future. Hmm. So that was a successful program. And I'm now offering that game as a free of charge application for your iPhone. Hmm. So I have a iPhone applica- app, which is called ESP Trainer, free of charge, that you can download from the uh, application store. Mm. And that leads you to the game, which will ring a bell and show you a beautiful picture whenever you guess the right answer. Mm. And what we found is that people improve their scores with practice. Mm. So this is a little ESP training device for your iPhone no cost, and people find it very entertaining. It's like bi- it's like psychic biofeedback, isn't it? Because you really gain it's confidence in it. That's right. You improve your scores with confidence and feed- feedback and reinforcement is the answer. Hmm. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to try that. <laughs> you try it, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Russell.